stories began with the history of humanity. There has never existed a people without stories. That's why a Sweeve is interested in the story in all of its form. With all of its novelistic density, a Sweeve will be the wild invasion of bande dessinée into literature. I'm glad that that's taken care of. I'm Andrea Gilroy, and this is Comics Crash Course. This epic statement, where we ended the last episode, is from the first issue of A Squeeve, a literary bande dessinée journal created by the publisher Casterman in 1978. Now, Casterman was primarily a book publisher, and crossing into journal publication provided them an opportunity to highlight new artists and projects they'd publish in the future. The specifically literary aims of their magazine proved to many that bande dessinée had truly grown up, and that it was a viable medium for adult audiences outside of just shock value. Throughout the 1980s, bande dessinée artists embraced the freedom this new audience and market allowed, experimenting with new forms and new genres. Two that particularly stand out are Nouveau Realisme and Nouveau Lien Claire. Let's start with Nouveau Realisme. According to Mazur and Danner in Comics, A Global History, Nouveau Realisme, quote, replaced the concept of a unified realism with a shifting, uncertain vision of the real. Open to multiple interpretations, it tends to engage political and social issues and is, almost by definition, anti-heroic, since it is difficult to conceive of a hero effectively influencing an unstable reality. The genre was defined more by shared themes than by shared aesthetics. On the one hand, you would have artists like Mobius or Jacques Tardy, whose work embraced surrealism and psychedelic imagery, playing with the boundaries of genre fiction. In fact, I'd like to point to Tardy's Adventures of Adèle Blanc Sec. On the surface, Adèle shares a lot in common with the Adventures of Tintin, running around Europe, solving exciting mysteries. On the other, she's nothing like him. Adèle herself is kind of a jerk, not a shining paragon, and more important to Nouveau Realisme is the setting and storytelling. Where Tintin's world is sometimes fantastical, but always solid and understandable in the end, Adele's world looks more realistic, like the sooty world of early 20th century Paris, but suddenly, and without much explanation, murder, cults attempting to resurrect old gods, pterodactyls, with the series, Tardy takes the expectation that a mystery-solving adventurer ultimately makes the world more understandable and flips it on its head. The world becomes more opaque. On the other side of Nouveau Realisme, you'd find Bazooka, a group of young artists, graphic designers, and journalists, including Christian Chapiron, Jean-Louis Dupré, Olivia Clavel, Philippe Renan, Bernard Vidal, and Jean Roseau. Influenced and inspired by punk, they used collage and collage-like effects to create purposely ambiguous texts. The collective only lasted about four years in total, but its aesthetic influence was far-reaching even beyond bande dessinée. Nouveau Lien Claire, on the other hand, used the aesthetic established by Hergé and the Brussels School for Children's Comics, Lien Claire, toward radically different purposes. In the hands of artists like Yves Charon, Just Swart, Jean-Claude Floch, and Ted Benoit, Nouveau Lien Claire could activate nostalgia, employ satire, and enact postmodern irony. This resulted in direct social commentary sometimes, but also a lot of meta-commentary about the previous generations of bande dessinée artists and texts. Now, a suive was a sign of mainstream success for adult bande dessinée, for better and for worse. Within a few years, bande dessinée magazines were everywhere, but not all of them were as discriminating in their taste as a suive. Many magazines preferred adult bande dessinée that were less interesting, but, well, more marketable. So when it became clear that bande dessinée journals could be profitable, corporate publishing houses decided to start buying up independent magazines. And with corporate ownership, 
That meant many journals suddenly found profitability became the primary editorial concern more than artistic merit. So, by the late 80s, bande dessinée audiences began to shrink. Well, was it because the work was less interesting or other factors? It's hard to say. But the result was that corporate publishers simply began to close less profitable magazines by the late 80s and into the 90s. Pilote folded in 1989, Tintin in 1993, Asquive managed to hold on until 1997. L'Echo de Savanes stayed in print, but only by becoming a softcore porn magazine that had some bande dessinée in it. Book publishers started only printing blockbuster books, safe, guaranteed successes. It became harder and harder for new artists to break into the business and for any artist to do much in the way of experimentation. And it's in this environment that a new generation of bande dessinée artists decided to challenge the mainstream environment and take bande dessinée back into their own hands. The first and perhaps most influential of these groups is L'Association. L'Asso, as it is sometimes fondly called, was founded in 1990 by Jean-Christophe Menu, Louis Trondheim, Patrice Kilofer, David B., Stanislas, Matt Contour, and Mokait. Members would drop out and new ones would join, including Yuan Sfar, creator of The Rabbi's Cat, and Marjan Satrapi, creator of Persepolis. Menu claimed that the objective of Lasso was, quote, to utilize comics as an expressive medium, in the absolute sense of the term. And this meant not just in regard to genre, but also in being tied to standard publishing formats for bande dessinée. You see, the standard format was pretty standard. Bande dessinée albums are hardcover, full color, and 48 pages long, usually also a standard size. None of that for Lasso. The book would serve the text. Though their first project was a quarterly anthology magazine called La Pen, they would soon start publishing graphic novels and memoirs at any length, usually in black and white. Though they would welcome any style and genre, Lasso artists tended to be a little bit more cartoony or iconic in their style and tended to favor memoirs. More groups would soon be founded. Loïc Neo, Fabrice Nu, and Javier Mousseau established Ego Com X in 1994. The group was very dedicated to autobiographical content, though they were a little bit more serious in tone and tended toward less cartoony art than L'Association. Perhaps the most famous publication to come out of Ego Com X is Neo's Journal, an intimate look at the daily life of Neo's experiences as a gay man in France. Ego Com X unfortunately folded in 2017. Also founded in 1994, amongst publishers Olivier Marbeuf and Ivan Alagbe, quote, wanted to bring a slowness to society, to play the role of dead weight, slow down the speed of transmission. They wanted works that explored the relationship between text and image, as well as addressing political and cultural realities. They focused on publishing works of minority creators in particular, including themselves, as well as uh, Aristophane and Blutsch. In 2002, Amok merged with the Belgian publisher Freon, and they created Freemok, and they're still publishing to this day. There are, of course, more of these, but uh, before we leave France, I need to talk a little bit about Angoulême. Angoulême is a small town in southwestern France with about 42,000 people, but once a year, its population jumps up to over 200,000 when it hosts the Angoulême International Comics Festival, the second or third biggest comics convention in the world the biggest being Komiket in Tokyo. Founded in 1974, the first Angoulême Comics Fest attracted over 10,000 people, but by its third meeting in 1977, it had attracted Hergé and Hugo Pratt to be its star guests. Now, a whole host of prizes are given out, but the Grand Prix, a Lifetime Achievement Award, is considered by many to be the most prestigious comics award in the world. The winner is the president of the next festival, which means that the following year they will illustrate the poster, lead the prize jury, and hold an exhibit of their work during the festival. Past Grand Prix winners have included Will Eisner, Mobius, Hugo Pratt, Art Spiegelman, Bill Watterson, and this year it was awarded to Rumiko Takahashi. So put Angoulême on your comics bucket list if it's not there already.
There's a whole lot more in the wide world of bande dessinée, but as with Japan, we only have so much time. We'll wrap up here for now. Merci beaucoup, and see you next week.